All right, so our, our handout today, we have three items. One is our devotion on true worship. And I chose the devotion, I chose this devotion, true worship today, because it connects last week's study with this week's study. Our devotion sets the tone for us today to explore more deeply the meaning of worship. Okay? So, true worship, taken from John 4, 23 and 24. What we have today in terms of our information is we have the devotion. Your second sheet is your grace sheet, which is our lesson notes for our lesson today. Nehemiah 13, lesson 11. And then our third bit of information on the yellow paper is the essence of true worship. So last week we spoke about worship, worshiping the Lord. And so what we're going to do, as we've been saying now, since I've been teaching, is that what we want to do is we want to get solidify a stronger understanding of what's being delivered here in our Sabbath quarter. We just don't want to open the quarter, answer the question, and then move on. What we want to do is we want to build our fund of knowledge so that when we leave this here, we leave this quarter, we will feel like we have studied and we have learned something, and then we have some information that we can now go back and refer to. Okay? So, our devotion, speaking about true worship, opens us up today, and again, what I'm going to do is we're going to read the devotion, and then I'm going to take about 10 minutes to speak about worship, and then that will set up the platform for our study today of backslidden people. Okay? Any volunteers for reading the devotion this morning? True worship from John 4, 23, and 24. I'll read it. Okay, please. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Keep reading, okay. Keep reading please. We are designed to worship God in spirit and in truth. As Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well, he sought to help her do this by imparting to her God's living water, John 4, 13 to 14. Jesus sought out this woman personally to give her abundant life. In the same way, the Father sees an encounter with each of us that is real and personal. The Samaritan woman has heard about God. Jesus said, true worship must be face to face with God. Worship is not religion, religion or ritual. Worship is an intimate and doubt encounter with, with a person. True worshipers Include the full cooperation, a recognition of who God is, holy, sovereign, almighty, loving, merciful. This re recognition brings about the realization of our sinfulness. True worship is life changing. It creates within the worshiper's heart a hatred for sin. True worship results in repentance obedient submission, and a desire for holiness, Isaiah 6, 1-8. True worship generates a desire to show mercy and to express forgiveness. It includes a joyful acceptance of all that God has provided by His grace. True worship is not exclusive. Just as the Samaritan woman rushed off to tell others of her encounter with the Lord, so true worshipers will compel the worshiper to include others. As a result of this woman's encounter with Jesus, many others from her village came to know him as well. The one who has truly worshipped will have a sense of peace and confidence. 
expectation of, me, of what God is about to do. The worshiper produces a transformed life, reflecting the one who has been worshipped. And the one who has been worshipped is God. Is that correct? Yes. So we see here, this is kind of a broad outline of what true worship is. Uh, in the in the third paragraph, starting with true worship, there's a sentence that says, true worship results in repentance and obedient submission. As we speak today about our lesson, we're speaking about two things, tithing and the observance of the Sabbath. Is that correct? Okay. And as our study before, we understand that the end point of true worship is to meet the needs of other people. And we see here that Christ, by interacting with this, the, 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 woman, the Samaritan woman, what she does is she goes, she goes back to town and she brings many others to, to Christ. So we see here that true worship, this is, this is a, 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 our, our basic working outline of, of, of true worship. Any other thoughts about our devotion this morning? Let's move on. I said, uh, we're going to take about, uh, we're, we're speaking about worship this morning, and we're tying last week's lesson with this week, okay? Let's open to our first page, lesson notes, where we're at, okay? Your, your great paper, okay? So just, are we, are we all there? Lesson 11, backslidden people. That's where we are, okay? So all through this, all through this quarter, basically what we're doing is we're building week by week by week. This week we're in lesson 11 with Nehemiah 13. We could not have started the quarter with Ezra and Nehemiah in chapter 13. We had to start it at chapter 1 and we continue to build and we take lessons from each one of those, each one of these weeks of study and we continue to build on it. So we look at lesson 9 very, very quickly. It came at the top of the page. Lesson 9, we were in Nehemiah 10. And you remember, Nehemiah, what he did was he counted the people that came with him, and there was 42,360 people. But on Nehemiah's list, there were no priests, right? The priests we understand, we've come to understand, is that the priests were needed for the, for the temple to function, and that was dictated to Moses by God in the Mosaic Covenant, right? And priests would be needed to lead the worship service the next week, when Nehemiah was dedicating the wall. So he could not have dedicated the wall last week in Lesson 10 if he didn't have any priests. Is that correct? So there was no priest on this list, so he had to go back and then have some priests come. Is that correct? Last week, Lesson 10, we were in Nehemiah 12, and what we studied was three aspects of worship. And I'm going to come back to worship in just a moment. But basically, we studied the music, we studied sacrifices, and we studied the Levites, right? We understand that the music was not like us going to some concert, right? What were they doing when the, what were, what were the congregants doing when the music was playing? That's correct. They, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were praying. Good morning. How you doing? So the music was not a concert, but basically it was, it was an environment where they were listening to music and they were praying. Right? Sacrifices, we understood they gave sacrifices. But all of those sacrifices in the Old Testament were pointing to, to what? To Christ, exactly right. So all these animal sacrifices were pointing to what? The promised seed, Christ, right? And then we have the Levites, and we studied the Levites. Remember the week before, I had given you some information on the Levitical priesthood. And so the priests were mediators between man and God. So the priests were what? They were intercessors, right? And we covered that in our Levitical priesthood. I'm sorry? No, I just said they were interceding. Yes, exactly. They were intercessors. So what we have is worship is the connection between last week's study and this week's study. Last week, worship involved music, sacrifices, and the Levitical priest. This week, we're speaking about the temple, tithing, and the Sabbath. However, the worship this week is a little bit defective. Is that correct? There were some problems with their worship. Is that right? Okay. So, 
Let's do this. Turn to your yellow page. We're going to speak about worship for a moment, okay? Yes, that is the essence of true worship, okay? And then once we finish this, then we will be able to go back and then open up our lesson and we'll see how our lesson just falls so nicely into the concept of true worship versus what they were doing at that time, okay? Are we good to move on? You got your yellow page there, right? Good. And I'm not going to read the whole document. I'm just going to cover a few things, but it's for you to take with you and to, and to read. So we understand worship is the humble response of a, regenerate, of a regenerate people. In other words, those are people who are saved, okay, to the self-disclosure of the Most High God. So that's God displaying his self to us. God reveals his self to us, and he reveals that self to us for those people who have been saved, okay? It's based upon the work of God. It's achieved through the activity of God by way of the Holy Spirit. It is directed to God, and it's expressed by, the lip, by lips and praise and by a life of service to who? To, to God. Okay. So worship refers to giving God the recognition that God deserves. It must be done in spirit and in truth from John 4.23. And we understand spirit speaks about spiritual realities. Nothing that's concerned about us worshiping anything here on earth. This is spiritual realities and truth. And truth is the entire, the entire counsel of God which we find in the Bible. Okay? The word of God. The response to God's grace and mercy leads to a true knowledge of God, which leads us to gratitude and to worship. And we understand that excellence is the goal in worshiping the Lord. Why? Because what's going to happen in heaven? That's exactly right. And it's going to be done in excellence, right? Because another name for God is excellent, right? Exactly. So God does nothing in chaos or in a haphazard way. It must be excellent, okay? Going a little bit further. So there's basically three elements of true worship that we're going to just run over quickly. Humility, reverence, and service, okay? We all there? We understand that humility denotes the act of, of bowing or being prostrate or prostrate oneself in submission and reverence. True worship views God in his perfection and man in our imperfection. Are we good with that? Reverence focuses on the awesome majesty of God, and service denotes the idea of to work, to labor, to serve God, okay? In the Old Testament, this service was often done by who? By the priest, right? But in the New Testament, we find in 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9, that we are now all considered priests of God. So now what this involves is this, this work is not delegated just to a few people, it's delegated to all the congregants of the church, okay? All of us, okay? Going forward, there are basic, there are four other, there are four other facets of worship. And our response to God, adoration, sacrifice, and proclamation. I'm still on the front part of the page, though, okay? What we see from last week is that worship is far more complex than music, than sacrifices, and then the, the Levites, the, the Levitical priests. Our understanding of worship is obtained from where? From the Word of God. Is that correct? Our handout, is one, our handout here describes a blueprint for what our worship should look like, but it gives us a glimpse of what worship is like in heaven. Now, as a matter of fact this morning, what we're going to do in a few minutes is we are going to sit in on the worship service in heaven, okay? And we'll be able to compare heavenly worship to us, okay? By the way, what time does worship service start on Sabbath morning in heaven? Anybody know? What time does worship service start? 24 7. Say it again? 24 7. It's going on all the time. Is that right? They're praying. Is there intercessory prayer going on? Absolutely. Okay. So, worship is just like 
prayer. If we don't spend time in prayer and in worship, we won't get good at it. Okay? We cannot expect to go to heaven and spend no time in prayer and worship here on earth and then get to heaven and expect that we will be able to participate in prayer and worship in the way that God expects us. So down here is considered to be preparation time. We agree with that, right? This is the time we got to prepare for when we get to heaven. Is that correct? Are we good with that? Because there's one standard in heaven, and we just said that that standard is what? It's excellence. That is correct. Going back to our page, the four, ask the four facets of worship. What I want somebody to do is I want somebody to uh, pull up Revelation 19, verse 1. And I want someone else to pull up Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Okay? Let me know when you have that, and then I'm going to go through these, these last four facets. Okay? Verse 1. After these things, I Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. I'll tell, you the, I'll tell you the text that I want you to read, and then someone else pull up Revelation 4, verse 8. Somebody have you, both of them? I have 19, 1. You have what? 19, 1. You got 19? Okay, hold that there. And who has Revelation 4? Got four you got eight. that. All right. Oh, she can't read, though. She, heard, she lost her voice. I need somebody else to pull up Revelation 4. I have 4, 8. Okay, good. Stay right there. So the four, the four facets of worship, I'm on page one of our yellow page, our response. So we worship God because he has made himself known to us, and he has instructed us to do what? Worship him. Is that correct? Adoration. It is adoration and praise which God rightfully expects of his creature. Is that correct? Okay. So we understand that worship has been going on in heaven for how long? Long before John Revelator got to write the book of Revelation. John Revelator writes the book of Revelation in about 95 AD. So that's about 30 years after Christ died. Worship has still been going on, right? And it's going on now. And it's going to go on forever, right? Who has Revelation 19, verse 1? Because now we're going to look at what worship looks like in heaven. True worship. Would you read uh, verse 1? Mm -hmm. Verse 3? Verse 4, 5, 6, and 10. Okay? Revelation 1. Go ahead. 19, 1. Go ahead. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, and glory, and honor, and power unto the Lord our God. Verse 3. And again they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Mm, verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four breast, I'm sorry, beast, fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Verse 5 and 6. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. In verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Absolutely. So we get a clear vision of what worship looks like in heaven, right? This is a majestic event that's going on. Everybody is involved and everybody is worshiping and recognizing who God is. The third one is sacrifice on your page. And last week we spoke about sacrifice. And we understand that sacrifice was central in the worship of, of Israel in the tabernacle and in the temple. And, and sacrifice was practiced in the temple as well. Now, if we turn our page, we understand at the top, 
that Paul tells us that we, as brethren, by the mercies of God, should present our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is spiritual service and which is what? It's true worship, right? All right. And the fourth is proclamation. Worship is not a spectator sport. You can't sit on the sidelines and participate in worship. You can't watch what God is doing. But rather, we must view ourselves as active participants upon the stage of worshipers. Let's look again and see what worship looks like in heaven this morning. Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Who, who's reading that, Rita? I do. Okay, 4, 8 through 11, please. Okay. Revelation 8, or 4, 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and the and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, mm. holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Mm -hmm. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and mm. cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Absolutely. Amen. So we have here, amen, a blueprint for what our worship should look like here. Because this is what worship appear, appears like in heaven. We have the ch Cherubim who are saying, holy, holy, holy. And we understand that when, when we see the word holy, 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 something mentioned three times, what does that do? What does that refer to? The Godhead. That's exactly right. The Godhead and refers to the holiness of just who God is, okay? And that's all that's going on. You have to just hold, hold, hold. And they never get tired. So that tells us that when we get to heaven, we are going to be some transformed individuals. Because otherwise, if they send us up there now in this day, when we got up there, what would we be doing? We'd be doing just like the Jews did in, 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 the, in the book of Numbers, right? Why are we here? Why did you bring us? We ain't got no meat. You give it this man. Why? Send us back to Egypt. Send us back down there. They be complaining all the time. So this tells us that when we get to heaven, we will be nothing like we are now. Okay? We'll be completely, completely transformed. As we finish our handout out, okay? Two more minutes. We apply our definition of worship through these four activities. Prayer, and we understand prayer, right? God has told us that we should send our prayers to him without anxiety, with thanksgiving, and send all of our petitions to him. But what we should do when we pray as well is that we should set aside certain times for prayer which are exclusively devoted to adoration and praise of God and God only. We shouldn't always be asking for something, but we should praise God for who he is and what he's doing. Testimony. And we understand that our testimony is an excellent opportunity to praise God for who he is and what he has done. Singing and music, we talked about that last week, okay? Singing and music can be, it can be an instrument through which our praise and adoration can be expressed to God and preaching, which is the presentation of the Word of God. Now, I said all this for one reason and one reason only. Who else is desirous of praise and worship? Satan. Satan. Look at the bottom of our page. So Satan desires this too. Satan desires worship. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Satan's aim is to do what? It's to overthrow the law of God. And the law of God is the law that governs all of creation. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. John 4.15 says that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Satan's sinful desire is to deceive mankind. We understand now that his mode of operation is deception. So that we will transgress God's law by, con by convincing us that God's law is no, fur no longer binding. And again, in our study this week, we're looking at two things. Tithing, okay, because tithing has always come under uh, some subject of controversy. Is it, should we be tithing now? Is that an Old Testament concept? Do we have to tithe now in the, in the New Testament? And the keeping of the Sabbath, because we understand that the Sabbath by other religions and other people has been changed. They have changed the day that God created for us to rest in him. God didn't do it, but others have. And we understand that that's all the work of who? That's correct. That's to circumvent the law of God. 
Satan says that in his desire, he has a desire for what? Self-exaltation. He says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And he leads, he leads mankind into what? False worship. Okay? So, that brings us back to our first page where we were first at, where true worship is directed to God, and it must be done in spirit, and it must be done in truth. Okay? So here we have a more in-depth explanation of what true worship is, okay? The aspects of true worship and how we must follow that and not be carried away with doing something else because that something else is not really honoring God and worshiping God. That's going to work somewhere else. Let's go back to our first page where we're at, Lesson 11. We're going to set up our lesson and then we're going to go ahead and open our study today. Lesson 11, we're speaking about backslidden people. We're in Nehemiah 13, right? This lesson explores three ways that the Israelites had backslidden. And so we must first go back to Nehemiah chapter 10. In Nehemiah chapter 10, the Israelites took an oath to be faithful. They agreed to renew the Mosaic Covenant. We remember that in our study, right? However, Nehemiah added three items in that oath. What he did was he said that they would, they would commit to taking care of the temple, that they would keep the Sabbath, and they would not intermarry with idolaters. Right? We remember that, right? So between last week and this week, Lesson 10 and Lesson 11, Nehemiah 12 and Nehemiah 13, Nehemiah returns back to Babylon. He returns, and then he returns back to Jerusalem for the second time. Nehemiah had came to Jerusalem the first time in 444 B.C., and Nehemiah stayed in Jerusalem for 12 years, and then he goes back to Persia because he was called back by who? The person that let him go in the first place, Artaxerxes I. Is that right? So we turn our page. So he returns to Jerusalem for the second time somewhere between two and five years after he left. So a very, very short period of time, and when he gets back, the Israelites had backslidden on their oath, they did not attend to the temple, they had violated the Sabbath, and they had intermarried with non-Israelites who were not believers. So their worship was defective. It was unreliable, right? Much like some of us are today, right? Sometimes we got a hard time paying tithing. Sometimes we got a hard time keeping the Sabbath. We can come up with all different excuses to do all various things, and it all seems right to us. But in the end, if it's disobedience, you're not being obedient to God. Is that correct? So our study this week involves the care of the temple and tithing and the Sabbath. Next week, we're going to deal with intermarriage. Sadly, it was the priestly leadership that Nehemiah had left behind that contributed to this sad situation. We're going to explore that in our lesson this morning. But that then leads us to our memory text today, which is on Saturday, Nehemiah 13, 22. And if somebody has the quarterly open, we can, um, we, can, we, can read the, um, we can read the memory text, and then we can go ahead and open our lesson, okay? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gate to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the goodness of your mercy. Okay. So, so, so Nehemiah tells them that they should go and cleanse themselves. What's he mean by cleanse themselves? Purify. Purify themselves. We understand that for priests to purify themselves, this was a, a ritual where they had to basically, right, they had to basically take a bath in a tub or something that was called a mikvah, okay? So they had to be spiritually clean. You had to take this bath. You had to immerse yourself in this water to be, to be, to be spiritually pure. But they, they will do that on their way to the temple. Mm -hmm. Some would do it on their way to the temple because mm -hmm. there was a, a place where they would stop mm -hmm. and they would purify themselves and then continue on to the temple. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he said they should go and they should guard the, the gates to sanctify the holy day. Sanctify means what? To consecrate it, right? Right? Okay, to make that day whole, okay? 
Exactly. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. And so Nehemiah at the end says a prayer for mercy. He's asking for mercy. Okay? So he says, purify yourself, sanctify, and then he prays saying, uh, he, he prays saying, uh, he, he prays a prayer of mercy for himself. Any thoughts about how our lesson sets up the day with, with, with worship last week, defective worship this week, but now we've looked at what true worship really is, and we looked at what worship looks like in heaven going on right now. Any thoughts? Any thoughts for that? I just have, I just have a comment. Go ahead. That um, where you know I've heard different people. Uh, now if you're speaking here, then you're you haven't been to the other side yet. But I've heard different people say that when you get to heaven, that you will live in paradise, mm -hmm. as obviously the Bible says, and that um, you know you will be free to do and live much happier life. Mm -hmm. And when uh, you went over uh, Revelation 4, mm -hmm. and you would say that when we get to heaven, we'll be uh, uh, worshiping God mm -hmm. all the time, all day. That does not sound to me like what other people say okay. your life in heaven will be. Well, I think this, I think that our life in mixer, from what I understand, yeah, from what I understand, it's going to be a mixture of things, but it's all going to be wrapped around worshiping God. Okay, it's all going to be worship, around worshiping God. What we have to understand is that our mentality today, we cannot conceptualize what our mentality will be when we get to heaven. We cannot, we cannot, the only thing we can do is read the words on the page. And even John says, this is my best description. You know, I mean, but this in no way, no way describes even what he was seeing. There was not human words for him to write down as to what, what I'm seeing. So I think that what we can take from that is our entire, our entire, entire being is going to be transformed completely. And we will not have the mentality that we have that we cannot imagine, we will think, understand what our mentality is. Two thoughts, and then we'll open a lesson. I, for me, I just say, look at God. I mean, where we are right today, where uh, uh, the church is being dedicated, uh, just God's awesomeness, uh, that that we can't come to him any kind of way. We, as his people, have to get right and to do things decently in, in an order. And it's not by accident or happenstance that we're right here with what they were doing mm -hmm. uh, compared to what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And we have to get in alignment with God to go forward so he can even yeah. use us as a people. Mm -hmm. and, and Raymond, too, my sister's uh, thought is that we have to look at worship of outside the box of what man has made worship to look like. Exactly. And that worship mm -hmm. is a lifestyle from the time that we're conscious That's to the right. time we go to sleep. And what we do is a form of, every, everything we do right. is a form of worship to mm -hmm. God. Absolutely. Okay, and, but people don't apply that because uh, a saying that I, I've heard a lot is that why are they acting holier than thou? And, then, and my understanding of that God saying this to the children of Israel is that they felt that their style of worship or what they were doing was better than what God requires. Mm -hmm. And it is a good thing that this lesson is at this time for, 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 all, for all people, for, for us to share because it brings us back in focus and balance of the movement of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, uh, congregation, you know. And if we look at worship as a lifestyle, like people, you hear people say, well, eating is a lifestyle. Worship is a lifestyle. You see, it's everything you do, do to the glory of God. That's worship, right? And many times, people, we have said, well, you know, I can keep the Sabbath the way, this is how I keep the Sabbath, or this is what I do, and, and it's not about what I do, it's about what God asks. I asked, a person asked me, well, you know, I don't want, I, I, I'm going to go to work on the Sabbath. I said, okay, well, let's just use that. You have that choice to go. You could go, and God 
God said don't. So yes, God has a problem with it, but he ain't going to hold you to it outside your will. I said, however, I said, if you look at it this way, that you're saying a man can give you a time schedule and you say, I'm going to follow it. But God could give you a same time schedule or a schedule and you say, I have an option. So that again comes down to lifestyle worship. Absolutely. Absolutely. One point, Inesco. Yeah, I like the way that you went over the scripture in Revelation. Right. They give the example. That's correct. Of what worship is. Right. In my, that's correct. In my, in, I'm not interrupting, but but that's our point. Whenever we want to know something about the way God is doing something, do we talk to some other body else? No. no. What do we do? We go to the Word of God because it's in there. We want to know how worship is going this morning in heaven. Go to Revelation. It's going to tell you just how they're worshiping this morning. If that don't make you happy. Uh, I don't know, okay? But that gives us an example of what our worship should be like here. The example is in the Bible. All we got to do is just open the Word and then go to it and consume it. And then we don't have to worry about anybody else explaining it to us or this means this to me. Forget that. That's not important. Right. Everything we read in the Bible, we can go to other places in the Bible and see how it applies to us. Well, that's say this over there, but over here it says this. Well, the word of God doesn't the word of God does not does not conflict against itself. So we have to make sure that when we're understanding, when we're reading that we're understanding correctly. And so that's a that's a topic for another for, for well, another yeah, day. Okay. It's so, not that we should study. It's not that we shouldn't go to people because God said let's reason together, but we should go and because he's, he has the teachers, he has the preachers, it's not that we should not go. We should not stand on what they say. Be a Berenonite and go and study and see if it's so. Exactly. I mean, even Jesus said do that. Right. You see, so that don't say that because the teacher said it, then this is the way it is. You see, because most of my overcoming came from me asking God and studying myself because the preacher or the teacher was not a person. So you have to guide people to the Holy Ghost, you know, the, the agent that is here now that mm -hmm. we can, you know, have a relationship the Bible, more. The Bible tells us that we should take charge of our own salvation. That's right. That's exactly right. That's what the Bible tells us. So, Let's go to Sunday, okay? Tainted leadership. So we're in Nehemiah 13, 1 to 9, and here we have Elisha and Tobiah. And so what, what were they doing that was unacceptable on Sunday? What had they done that was unacceptable? Who was Elisha? They were desecrating the Sabbath. They were desecrating the sanctuary. Okay, so we're dealing with the sanctuary here today. So who was Elisha? Elisha, he was a priest. He was the, chief, he was the high priest. He was the head honcho. He was the guy who was in charge, right? He was responsible for the temple. Is that correct? He was appointed the supervisor of the storeroom of the temple, right? But he also was a relative of who? Yeah, Tobiah. That's exactly right. And who was Tobiah? He was our priest. He was our ruler. Ah, uh, but he was also who? Who, what, what, what was he? Was he a Jew? No. A Jew. He was an Ammonite. Right? He was an Ammonite. Okay? And who else was he? He was one of the most fierce opposers of Nehemiah. Remember? He wrote those letters to intimidate Nehemiah when Nehemiah was building the wall around Jerusalem. Right? So, what did Elisha do that was so offensive to him? What did he allow T T Tobiah to do? He Take a residency. He took a storeroom in the temple. Right. With right? a tithing office. Yes. That's exactly right. 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 Mercy. Okay. And so then, Tobiah was granted what? This is an Ammonite who's been given permanent residence right. in, the, in, the in the temple. temple. Yeah. Exactly. Mercy. So what this does, this is establishes him as a leader of the temple. But also, also to the people, also to Jewish people, the Israelites, right? Which should not, which should not have happened, right? So we understand here in Nehemiah 13, 1 to 9, what Elisha did, what Tobiah did, 
and why it was that it was unacceptable to them. So, Elder, we, and, and this could come into this day and time when we are sometimes our leaders are careless in letting ministers outside our faith take the pulpit. So, I mean, we make an application. That's why we're here, to make the application or when we say we want to invite people to do, to present something to the congregation at AY or Sabbath school or something like that, I mean, it's, it's a time and a place for it. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're looking at, it's, it's, it's like this, when I, came, when I came into the church, and I have to use my own experience, that my pastor, they said, well, we're going over to this church to do this. And my pastor said, all of you all are going except for her. And it's because I had just come out of where they was going back to minister. Mm -hmm. So it was wise counsel mm -hmm. at that time because it's like I'm one right now, as you said, this says this and this says this. And I said, well, wait a minute. You said come out and now you're going back? And that was my question right then and there. So why I want to go back there? Mm -hmm. Not understanding why they were going back. They didn't say why. You see? And and so that's why we have to really worship God in our decision. Exactly. And, 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 and the, the takeaway from our previous conversation was that we need to be very careful of who we associate with. Yeah. Right, exactly, because we're supposed to associate with what? Like-minded people, like-minded Christians, My right? Goodness. We can't expect to get we can't expect to speak to someone about worship and about tithing and about the Sabbath to someone who doesn't know anything about that. Right? And we shouldn't do that. Am I right? In a way in a way of being in association, not in a way of ministry. ministering and, and teaching. So right. yeah. Let's go to Monday. The Levites in the field. Nehemiah 13, verses 10 to 14. So what is the problem here that Nehemiah sees? Okay, what's the problem? Because he's going to remedy something, but we first got to identify the problem that he sees. What's the problem? The problem is that the uh, Levites mm -hmm. were not receiving their portion. And so because they wasn't receiving their portion, uh, they had to take care of their family. So mm -hmm. they was going outside to get work so they can maintain and take care of right. them where they should have been getting it from the people. Right. Exactly. And so the problem was they had to go back to work because who wasn't doing what? The church the church the church right. what, what weren't they bringing to the temple? The tithes and offerings. They weren't bringing the tithes and offerings, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem was was that the, the Levites had now gone out. The Levites in the fields had to go back to work the fields so that they could take care of their family. Okay, this upset Nehemiah, so he says, listen. What, did, what does Judah have to do? They have to start bringing the tithe and offering. Did they obey? Did they agree to do that? Did they begin to do that? Yes, they did. Exactly. Because again, again, the Levites, could they work? Should they work? What's the, what was the responsibility totally of the Levites? To take care of the temple. Some of the Levites, as we talked before, were priests, but others weren't priests. Those who were not priests still had some function in the church for maintaining the function that the, the, the make sure the, church, the temple functioned as a temple according to who? To God. What God had told Moses how he wanted the temple to function. Make, go ahead, make a point. So an application with this and where we are now is that most people don't understand when the conference says that uh, when they lay out a budget of what it takes to have a minister, a full-time minister, part-time ministers, and this, we don't understand it. But then when you see that the, the tithe base is down, then they can't hire full-time ministers. When the tithe base is down, then some congregations cannot have their own minister. What do you mean by we don't understand? I said that's some people. That's a, that's a, that's I'm a, saying it's some people. Well, I'm saying it's some people don't understand <laughs> the, the like our tie system now is just as similar to this. Is that our pastors and evangelists they get paid by the tie, right? Mm -hmm. And then we say, well, okay. And then you say, well, somebody may add, well, where's our pastor? And the pastor is going to do. Uh, revival somewhere, and sometimes that offsets their their income. 
Believe it. I mean, this is just Sabbath school and reality. Right. And it's well, not everywhere, but this is why it's important for us to be, you know, faithful where we have a clear worship, that we're worshiping God faithfully in our stewardship. Let's deal, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're going to deal with tithing off. I want, I, want, I want two texts to be pulled up for us. We're on Tuesday, tithing off. Okay? Two texts. The first I want is, um, I'm going to pull up Deuteronomy 14, and we're going to go uh, verse 22 to 29, and then I want someone to pull up Numbers 18, 25 to 30. And while they're doing that, Tuesday, tithe and offering. So what's the function? What was the function of the tithe and offering? What, what, was, what was the function of that? To take care of the temple. Right, take care of the priest and take care of the temple. Exactly, exactly. To take care of the entire temple, all of the expenses, everything that was associated with the temple, with the Levites and the people working, that's what the tithe and offering was for. Okay? Right. How should we tithe today? The same. The same. Okay? Who has Deuteronomy 14? I do. 22. And I'm going to read, read it just 22 to uh, 22 to 29 for me, please. Okay? Now we're speaking about tithing here now, okay? And again, what we want to do is that what we want to do is we want to refer to the Word of God when we are discussing these things in class, okay? <laughs> so go ahead. Deuteronomy 22, 14, yes. 22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil, and the persons of thy herds and of thy flock, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord uh, thy God hath blessed thee, then shall thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shall go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desire. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou and thy household. And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part, no inheritance with thee. At the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithes of thine increase the same year, and shalt lay it up, uh, it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part, nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are within thy gates, shall come, and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. Okay, and then let's go to Numbers, Numbers 18, and we're going to read 25 to 30. So what that tells us is that you're supposed to bring a tenth of what you have. If you live a long way from the temple, it's fine. Just sell what you got, get the money, bring it to where the temple is, and then you convert it back into products and then bring them to, and then bring that to the temple. Numbers 18, 25 to 30. Who has that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. The Lord also told Moses, Give these instructions to the Levites. When you receive from the people of Israel the tithes I have assigned as your allotment, give a tenth of the tithe you receive. A tithe of the tithe to the Lord as a sacred offering. The Lord will consider this offering to be your harvest offering as the first grain from your own threshing floor or wine from your own wine press. You must present one tenth of the tithe received from the Israelites as a sacred offering to the Lord. This is the Lord's sacred portion, and you must present it to, to Aaron the priest. Mm -hmm. Be sure to give the Lord the best portions of the gifts given to you. Also, give these instructions to the Levites. When you when you present the best part of your offering, it will be considered as though it came from your own threshing floor or one press. Okay, so God tells the, the Israelites to bring 10%. What's he tell the Levites to do after they get that 10% that was given to them? What should the Levites do? 
they give it ten. So everybody is responsible for doing what? Paying a tithe of ten percent. Yes. If somebody gave you a thousand dollars a should you tie that if somebody gave me gave you a thousand dollars as a gift, should did you thank God for the gift? It's an No, did you did you thank God for the gift? If somebody walked up to me and gave me I'm not to myself, but those asking. If somebody gave me a thousand dollars, first thing I say is thank God. And the second thing I do is take a hundred dollars and give it to God. That's ex that's exactly that's exactly what I would do. Exactly. So when we tithe, do we do it out of our abundance or according to our abundance? According. Cool. According, what's the difference? Uh, well, it sounded like from the way that it was just explained, if, you, if I was given a thousand dollars, right, then I would take a hundred and give it. So mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. If I had a hundred, uh -huh. I would give ten, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. So that that is giving out of what? Of that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Now, if you got a thousand and you walk up to God and you give him a dollar, mm -hmm. you're giving him out of your abundance. But you're not being obedient. That's not according mm -hmm. to your abundance. That's why right. I asked the question. I asked the question mm -hmm. because some people, you know, are, are told when you get a gift, if, if you are working and you get it, you, you already pay your tithe or you're working. Mm -hmm. So why give, you know, a gift, a tithe out of what you get as a gift? I think the word of God tells us that God loves what? A cheerful gift. Exactly. And the more right. you give, the more you're blessed. Mm -hmm. and, and, exactly. well, and, and, the, and the more you increase, the more God's supposed to get his because it all belongs to God. And, that, and, and that's what it says in Deuteronomy. So if you have a good year and you produce more, then what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to give according to to that increase, according to that abundance, right? So if you have a real good year, last year you gave 100, you have a good year, you got 200 this year, you have, I don't know if I'm going to get, no, what you should do is give according to what you have been given, what you have been given, right? Okay, so that explains the tithe and the offering, okay, on Tuesday. Let's go to Wednesday, treading the wine press. So what is the issue that Nehemiah addresses in Nehemiah 13, 15, and 16? What's the issue here that he's, that he's speaking about? Okay, so we were, we were talking about tithing and offering. Now we're going to go to what? The Sabbath, right? So what's going on here, treading the wine presses on the Sabbath? What's happening there? They were selling, uh, the merchants were selling, and they were working on the Sabbath, and that was not honoring God's backstep. Okay, so you said the merchants, were those all, those people other than Jews, or were some of the Jews? Some of them were Jews, right? Some of them were Jews, and some were outside, some of them were not Jews. They all were selling items on the Sabbath, is that correct? And they were so, doing it, it doing and around the temple, the sanctuary. They were doing it where the, the, the household, where they live. Right. So you're answering the second question. So what does what does Nehemiah do to stop this problem with them selling on the Sabbath? In other words, people were coming. They were coming from from around, and some people actually who were living in Jerusalem in the walls were coming. The gates were open. They were bringing these products in on the Sabbath, and they're selling these things on the Sabbath. Uh, you know, in Jerusalem. So what does Nehemiah do first? He commanded that they shut the gates first. Exactly. He asked the priest shut the to gates. go. He asked the priest, the, he asked the leader to go. That's our memory and text. Is that, that correct? That, and that's the key. Purify themselves. Yeah. And then go there, sanctify the day, and close those gates. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Jesus. Okay. Did he condemn them? Did Nehemiah condemn the people? Oh, yeah, we're getting to that. We're getting to that. So he tells them, he, te he tells them, go close, go, go, go close, go close the gates. When does he close the gates? Before the sun. Before the sun. He closes it on the Sabbath. When the sun goes down until sundown Friday, until sundown Saturday, the gates are closed. So what do these rascals do who come into the city? What are they doing now? Now they're outside the gates. Sister Buchanan, what are they doing? 
they're standing outside the gates waving products outside the gates. Okay? There they are. So now what does Nehemiah do? What does he do, Sister Buchanan? He rebukes them, right? Exactly. And what does what does he tell them? He threatens them with, threatens them with what? Right? And being arrested. Right? He said, take that stuff away from here, right? Exactly. And did they do that? Yes, they did. Absolutely, they did that. Right. Can you imagine having that power? I mean, I just give you a threat. And you say, well, he said we shouldn't do it, so guess what? We're not going to do it. Can you imagine having that power? That's a problem. Well, I tell you what, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you what, in our entire study of Ezra and Nehemiah, one thing that we have come to learn is that the hand of God was on Ezra and Nehemiah. Obedience. That's correct. And who realized that the hand of God was on Ezra and Nehemiah? The people did, right? And so all the time when Ezra and Nehemiah are telling them to do something, you never see any resistance. No, no grumbling, nothing like that. He said, get out of here, get out of here. Don't stand outside the gates. They left and that resolved the issue, but right? They, they stood in the, the, the obedience of this is what God asked us to do in the worship. This is how God asked us to worship. And, and, and we have that. We have the same. We have it. Right. And so, but when our some of our leaderships act like there's no backbone to stand on truth as it is in Jesus and as it is in the Bible, mm -hmm. then that's why, again, Things are not done in accordance to the way God asks us to worship Him in tithing and in Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And that's God's. That's, and the, that's, the, that's God's. God's. God's personified uh, 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 function that He gives to His people when the Word says, "Touch not my anointed and do my people no harm." Uh -huh. uh, because then you know that you're not messing with me; you're messing with God. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. And so then, uh, in verse in verse twenty two. Again, at the end of, of verse 22, Nehemiah says, Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. Remember me, O Yes, right. He wasn't a perfect man at first. Exactly. So here Nehemiah is, right, he is praying a prayer for mercy. But, but what is he doing? He's including himself. He includes himself in that prayer for mercy. Okay, so Nehemiah knows, even though the God, the hand of God is on him, that he is a sinner and he is in need of mercy, just as we are. Right? Absolutely. All right. If we go then, the first day, did not your fathers do thus? Okay. And. <clears throat> we have to go back to Nehemiah 13, uh, verses 17 and 18, so we can answer this question, okay? Nehemiah 13, 17 and 18, okay? Now, did not your fathers do thus? What is he speaking about? That's correct. Direct desecrating the Sabbath. Didn't your fathers do the same thing that Nehemiah is accusing these people of doing? Desecrating the Sabbath. Is that correct? Okay. So, to get some background, let's read Nehemiah 13, 17, and 18. And then we're going to ask the question. Go ahead. Who has, who has 17 and 18? If they don't ask, go ahead, please. So I confronted the leaders of Judah. Why are you proclaiming the Sabbath in this evil way? Wasn't it enough that your ancestors did this sort of thing so that our God brought the present trouble upon us as, and our city? Now you, you say, are bringing even more. You say 13, 17, 17, yes, 13, 17, verse 17, and verse 18. That's what she has. Okay, 13, 17 to 18? Yes, right. Nehemiah 13, verses 17 and 18. And it starts out that Moses sent them to spy out the land. No. No, that's it, verse 13. No, I have a different train. No. no. no sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Read, yeah. seven, read 17 and 18 again for us. Huh? So I confronted the leaders of Judah. 
Why are you pertaining this pain in this evil way? Wasn't it enough that your ancestors did this sort of pain? Mm -hmm. So that our God brought the present troubles upon us and our city. Mm -hmm. Now you are bringing even more wrath upon the people of Israel by permitting this habit to be a desecrate, to be desecrated in this Okay, so here's Nehemiah going back and saying, your fathers did the same thing, and it got so out of hand that the only way God could, could fix this problem was what? Send it to Babylon for 70 years. Now we've come out of Babylon, we're back here now, and what are you guys doing? You're doing the same thing again. You're desecrating the South, right? What do we do today sometimes? All right. So now, our question is that in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what was the issue here, and how does and how does an understanding of ancient Israel history help explain why this controversy arose? So here we have Nehemiah accusing the Israelites of desecrating the Sabbath, and here we're going to the four Gospels, and we're looking at what the issue is. So in these four Gospels, what do they accuse Christ of doing? The rules are the but here we go. We got human beings, Pharisees and Sadducees, going to correct who? Jesus, Jesus Christ, right? That's not going to happen. So what that shows us is that they did not, in their fanaticism, they did not understand it. They did not understand the meaning of the Sabbath because Christ said it was fine to do good work on the Sabbath. Let's go to just a, one one of the texts, okay? And let's do, someone pull up Mark, uh, chapters, I mean, I'm sorry, Luke. Luke. Chapter 6. Luke. And we're going to read just from 5 to 11. I want somebody to do that, but I also, I also want somebody to pull up Exodus, chapter 20, verses 9 to 11. Can somebody do that for me? Exodus, chapter 20. 9 through 11. Somebody have that? You got it. You say Exodus 20. Exodus 20. 9 through 11. Yep, yep. Luke. Luke. Luke, okay, that's fine. Who, who has Exodus uh, chapter, uh, chapter 20, 9 through 11? Go ahead, please read it. Oh, okay, 9 through 11, Exodus. Now, we're just speaking about, before you start, we're talking about desecrating the Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. Here we're going to look at, Luke, uh, at Exodus 20, verses 9 to 11, which gives us what? The, the fourth commandment, right? Go ahead and read the fourth one first, please. Verse 8. That's what it verse no, 9. Oh, you, well, it's just 9 to 11, really. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it, it is that in it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that was in thy gate. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all in, the, in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. All right. So that tells us what that tells us what God's thinking was when He created the Sabbath. It was a day. He blessed it and He made it holy. Right? It was a day we rest and nothing that's associated with us should be should be worked. Right? That, that is why when you think of the people that do business on the Sabbath, when God blesses, He doesn't take away the blessing. That's the best day, business day, on the Sabbath because he, when He said, "We're not just and we are just," so the business always prosper. Mm -hmm. on the God blessed you. Mm -hmm. Luke, chapter 6, 5 through 11. And so here now we're talking about Christ and them being, and the Pharisees and the Pharisees accusing him of desecrating the Sabbath. We'll close out with this with the text. Luke 6, verses 5 through 11. Please read. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord of also of the Sabbath. And he came to pass, and it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. 
But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day, days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking around about them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thou hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Okay, so the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So what's that mean? He, gets, uh, he makes the rules. He created. He created. <laughs> right? And we understand that Christ is sinless. So is it possible for Christ to desecrate the Sabbath? No. It is impossible for him to do that. So it shows us again that these people who thought they knew everything really did not know very much because Christ comes back and says it is fine to do good on the Sabbath. Um, Actually, I like this verse. I'd like to say something before mm -hmm. we close. It's time for us. Some of us as the Adventists, we tell people that the Sabbath begins at 6 o'clock. And it's time for us to stop telling people that. Tell people that the Sabbath begins sunset for the evening. Right. Because some I talk to people and they say, oh, the Sabbath be I said, no, the Sabbath doesn't begin 6 o'clock. It's right now sunset like 4.30. Mm -hmm. That's when the Sabbath begins. That's correct. Yeah, I remember when we had to teach that on the regular. Uh, you know, but what's very interesting is verse number nine when he says uh, to save life or to, to, to destroy life. Right. And yet he healed that man. That's correct. That was saving life. That's exactly and so the beauty of the Sabbath for me, I mean, the saving of life was the addition of worship and praise and everything else. Right. Because you can find yourself in that position to where you're helping someone, pray, saving a life, or you can put yourself in a position to where you're destroying a life. Right. You see here we have the example of, of Christ himself mm -hmm. helping, helping this man. So all that we should do, our behavior, should be what? christ -like. If Christ came upon somebody on a Sabbath that needed help, what would he do? Definitely. He would help him. Exactly. He wouldn't step over him. He wouldn't cross the street, walk down and cross over the side of the street. He would do that. He would help him. Okay. And that's what we're instructed to do as Christ. Be Christ-like, and it's fine to do good on the Sabbath. But some of them are so guilty of legalism. I mean, with the legalism, well, you're not, you know, you're not supposed to be doing this, that, and the other. And the whole matter of the issue is God said it's okay to do good on the Sabbath. That's the whole and the, uh, and the problem with that is that they are looking at the letter of the law, but they're not looking at the intent of the law, the spirit of the law, okay? That's right. So they're being so fanatical in what you can't do. They accuse Christ of breaking the Sabbath when he's walking through a grain field. He popped a grain thing off and he ate it. Is he breaking the Sabbath? What? You know? You, you, that's, it just doesn't make any sense. So they got so hung up in their interpretation of the Sabbath and what they'd be doing, what they couldn't do, they lost sight of really what we should be doing on the Sabbath. Any other thoughts this week? Powerful, action-packed week. Worship. Okay. Yes. Very, uh, very, very detailed study. Next week, we will look at the third aspect of them breaking that oath, which was marrying people were not Israelites and who were non-believers intermarriage. Well, I will do things on the Sabbath, but it has to be a necessity. Say it again? It has to be a necessity. Uh -huh. I will do things on the Sabbath, but it has to be a necessity. Well, I think... said the Adventist, I think we should prepare, you know, before sunset Friday evening. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, I think some of us, I'm here, I'm not judging anybody, but I know I call some of the Adventist people here. And they're not going to be at the store on Friday. Well, you know, the, 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 store on Friday night. the Bible tells us I'm that. I'm not going to mean anybody, but as some of the Adventists, we really know what some of the Adventists are. Right. The Bible well, tells us that, that, that God is going to send in our yeah. presence uh -huh. angels that are going to look like homeless people standing on the corner. Mm -hmm. God is going to judge our reaction to those people. Okay? 
So what we should do is we should sensitize ourselves. We should be sensitive to helping people first. If there's some question as to whether I did something right or wrong, we understand that God is a forgiving God. He's a faithful God. And his love lasts forever and ever. So if we have any question about that, we can always go back and pray to God. And if it wasn't right, we can ask for forgiveness. And we then understand that God will forgive that sin if it wasn't And then give us the power to overcome it. Absolutely. That we should keep doing the same thing. It's four minutes before 11. Powerful, powerful lesson this week. Thank you, guys. Let's, uh, let's, close, let's close out in prayer this morning, okay? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again this morning for this week of study on worship, the essence of true worship. And we thank you, God, for just coming into our lives, bringing this information to us, and then, God, helping us to be better Christians, more Christ-like, so that when we see people that are in need, it's because of our walk with you that we can reach out into the world. So we thank you again for the study this week, for the many blessings that we receive by opening the Word this week. Bless our main, our main session this afternoon at our 11 o'clock hour, and then continue to draw us closer to you through the reading of your words. In Jesus' name this morning, we